I turn your attention this morning to the book of Acts chapter 27, and we begin reading in verse 1, Acts chapter 27 and verse 1. And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus's band, and entering into a ship of Adramatea, we launched, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, on Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us, and the next day we touched at Sidon. And Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. And when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of uh, Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. And when we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against Sinidas, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete, over against Salome, and hardly passing it, came unto a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. Now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them, and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage not only of the lading, which is the cargo, and the ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phoenice and there to winter, which is a haven of Crete and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. Lifting from verse 10, our passage that we want to focus on today, I'd like to speak on this subject, the enemy of hurt. The enemy of hurt. Would you bow your heads and pray? Lord, we're thankful to be in your house today and thankful for your word, thankful for your people that have gathered under the banner of your name. We ask you, Lord, now that the Word of God would penetrate our heart, mind, and soul, change us from the inside out, let it fall on good ground. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. Paul had appealed unto Caesar, which was his right as a Roman citizen. As you well know, Paul had been a great um, apostle and missionary for the cause of Christianity. But prior to that time, he had been a Pharisee, he had been a member of the Sanhedrin, a doctrine of the law. He had led the pursuit of Christians prior to his conversion. But now that he had converted, because of his education, because of his forceful, persuasive nature, because of his commitment to the gospel, he became a great apostle, a great advocate for the gospel of Jesus Christ, especially among the Gentiles. This stirred up uh, the Jewish hierarchy, and uh, they uh, many times tried to take his life, and so uh, one thing that had happened recently before he appealed to Caesar was that they had uh, attempted to ambush him, but it had leaked out. He had received word of it, and so he now had appealed unto Caesar. As a Roman citizen, he had a right to do that, but it took some time, and uh, he, he was uh, led to uh, stay in Caesarea by the sea uh, for two years. Caesarea by the sea was a a city that the Roman hierarchy hung out in. They liked it there. It was by the water. Herod had built that beautiful city for the, for the Roman hierarchy. It had a hippodrome. It had, a, um, it had a, a big amphitheater for their plays and concerts. and had a beautiful harbor that was very advanced for that time. And uh, much of it you can even visit to this day. We've been there several times. And much of it is uh, excavated and, and very easy to walk around and to see uh, what a nice area this was. This is really where uh, the centurions, the Roman uh, leaders, uh, was. This is where Peter went down and preached to Cornelius, uh, who was also a centurion. It's no doubt where Pilate lived. And of course, they would 
the Roman governors would live there, but they would go up to Jerusalem when they had to attend to the legal matters of the day, which is certainly what Pilate did when Jesus was on trial. And at this particular time, there was a Roman governor by the name of Festus. And after two years, Festus and uh, the king of the Jews at that time was a man by the name of Agrippa. They usually had kings that were just in charge of the Jewish affairs, but yet they were still under the Roman government as the Roman government occupied that area as well as they did many other nations. And so um, Paul gave his testimony. They allowed him to talk, and he shared with them what had happened, and they couldn't see any reason at all why uh, the Jews wanted him killed. But uh, they reasoned among themselves, said, you know, probably if he hadn't appealed unto Caesar, we would have just, you know, let him go. But because he has appealed unto Caesar, we have to make sure that he goes uh, to Rome. And Paul, uh, no doubt, wanted the protection of the Roman government from the Jews. But more than that, I believe Paul wanted to get to Rome because he wanted to evangelize Rome. And even though he went as a prisoner and he eventually made it there, he wrote this great book that we have in the New Testament called Romans. But it's also clear that Paul also was able to witness while he was in Rome. And there was indeed a church in Rome even after uh, the death of Paul at the hands of Nero, who was the emperor at the time that uh, Paul's life was taken. But Paul had appealed uh, to go, and so they had to wait until they could get the right ship and the right journey and the right people together and get the, uh, you know, the prisoners gathered. And they put them all under the charge of this Roman um, centurion, and his name was uh, Julius. Now, he would be in charge of the prisoners, and Paul... Uh, was a prisoner. They would go by boat and uh, it would require several stops and the cargo and for this voyage to be successful they had to navigate several different things. They didn't just get on a plane and fly like we would today. Uh, there was a lot that had to take place and so Acts 27 tells the story of this trip. It's an incredible story. It's a, a very interesting story of this, uh, this journey that they were on to, to move from Caesarea by the sea which is uh, not far from Jerusalem, across the Mediterranean, stopping at these different islands and going through these different stays, and then eventually making their way across the Mediterranean a little more than going up north to where uh, Rome was in Italy. And the interesting thing about this journey is because it really is a microcosm of life. This journey that they had, it's all contained in one chapter in the Bible, Acts chapter 27, and yet it contains all the aspects that you and I have in our journey called life. It has unexpected storms, it has unexpected friends, unexpected attacks, unexpected miracles. Most of life is unexpected, and good and bad, and yet this journey illustrates all of that. Everything that you can imagine in life is represented in this journey across the Mediterranean. One of the things that we see early on, and even the verses that we read to you was that Julius, this Roman centurion, he was uh, tasked with the responsibility of, of overseeing Paul and the other prisoners and making sure they get to Rome. But he was kind to Paul. And uh, when they stopped in Sidon, Julius gave Paul liberty uh, to catch up with his friends there and to even stay at the house of his friends. He had friends there and, and uh, he uh, gave him leave. He did not see Paul as a flight risk. Uh, perhaps uh, at this point, uh, uh, Julius already had trust in Paul, and maybe even uh, Paul had had conversation with him. It was obvious that Paul was not your average prisoner, and uh, Julius was not concerned about Paul running off. He gave him this liberty, and maybe they had had conversations. Maybe Paul had explained why he had appealed unto Caesar. Maybe he had explained what he was accused of, and maybe Paul had already begun to witness to this man. Paul was known to win his captors to the Lord. He was a powerful soul winner and a powerful teacher, and so anyone that got close to him, he was likely to convert them to Christianity. And maybe that had already started with uh, this centurion, but uh, after several stops changing to a larger ship uh, that was carrying wheat, uh, from Egypt to Rome. The Bible says in the text we read, coming from Alexandria, that was Egypt, and making its way to Rome, they found no wind. They couldn't get a wind. They, they were moving so slowly, it was just ridiculous to even be out in the water. There was just no wind. Um, the writer of Acts, Luke, who's no doubt on this journey, he tells about how the, the wind was contrary, and we barely were moving, and they were stopping at all these different places, and the trip was taking longer than normal. And so they finally rested in Crete, an island that's called uh, a particular place of the island, it's called the Fair Havens. It was near the city of Lycia. 
And because it had taken longer than usual, there was uh, now a time of season that they were entering into they were, where dangerous storms were uh, sort of lurking in the, in the wintertime. It was much more dangerous to traverse this area of the Mediterranean, much like we're familiar with in Florida, the hurricane season. They were uh, now coming out of the summer months and they were uh, entering into this season uh, of the winter months where it would be more dangerous, where the seas would be uh, much more violent and and, and it would, uh, you know, you're out there, you're a sailboat, and you, you don't have all the modern conveniences that we think of today. It's very risky. You're at the mercy of the wind and the waves and the storm. And so um, it, it appears that they were toward the close of September uh, because uh, at Fairhaven, uh, where they were at, the apostles, maybe even the Jewish leaders uh, on board had had observed uh, the great day of atonement, which was the one fast of the Jewish calendar. And so Luke makes mention of this fast, and now the fast had passed. It, it, it signified where they were at on the calendar. The season for now navigating with sailing vessels was drawing to a close, and they were entering this time of, of more tumultuous season of the winds and the waves, and so Paul had counseled delay. But his words had gone unheeded. The man who knew God was wiser than the men who knew the sea. And Paul had said, I don't think we should leave now because much hurt will come to the cargo, to the ship, and to the passengers. Now, before we extract from the word of God what we know to be the enemy of hurt, I think it's important for us to first of all eliminate some myths that we have, even in our own society as to what really fights against hurt. All of us want to move away from hurt. Nobody wants to hurt. In fact, change is very difficult. They say the only reason that people will change is if they're moving away from pain or toward reward. That's the only reason we'll really change if we have to. And certainly the more motivating of that is to move away from pain. If we want to sit here and be comfortable and we don't want to have to move around too much, then we take the path of least resistance. That's what we do as humans. But if all of a sudden they, they, they turn loose 10 wild lions running around through the place, it, you wouldn't need a lot of motivation to get up and run out the door because you would dissect the situation as being potential harm. If all of a sudden the building's on fire, you wouldn't have to have somebody standing up here saying, please leave the building. The flames would speak for themselves. And so in our human nature, we, we naturally want to move away from hurt. The challenge for all of us is to understand what moves us toward hurt and what moves us away from hurt. So before we determine what is really the things that protect us from hurt, let's talk about the things that don't. The first thing that we know is that the enemy of hurt is not liberty. It's not liberty. I love America and I'm thankful for liberty, but our freedoms are not the enemy of hurt. It's not the antidote for hurt. Sometimes the more liberty we have, the more we hurt ourselves. You give a child total freedom, he can wander out on the road and hurt himself or wander into the kitchen and touch a hot stove and just because you have liberty just because you have freedom doesn't mean you're inoculated from hurt in fact if you give your flesh everything that your flesh wants unbridled liberty you partake of whatever seemeth good in your eyes ladies and gentlemen that alone will be the source of a lot of hurt Paul was given great liberty by Julius to be with his friends. But liberty in and of itself is not what will war against hurt. The second thing that we know is that the majority is not the enemy of hurt. Just because everyone is doing it does not make it right. Democracy in and of itself is based on majority rule. It is not the enemy of hurt. We think of America as being a democracy, but really we're a republic. We, we're represented by people that go and vote for us in the halls of Congress and so forth. But if you look at a true democracy where majority rules, the only way 
that that democracy works is that the people that rule are ruled by God. You take God out of the equation and all you have is a mob mentality. It doesn't protect you from pain. In fact, if you look at the majority of Germany and the majority of Japan and the majority of the Axis nations, uh, they were wrong in the 1940s. Uh, and even though it was the majority of those nations, uh, they were wrong. And it was one of the most hurtful decades uh, of human history because just the majority doing it does not mean uh, that it will protect us from pain. Verse 12 says, and because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part, everybody say the majority. the majority, the most of the advisors of what they should do, whether we should sail or not sail, the majority advised uh, that they depart. They said, well, you know, we've, we've got to leave from here, which leads us now to the third thing that's not the enemy of hurt, and that is logic. It appeared logical because of where they were at in Crete that they would move down to another place that was better for them to uh, winter in. And it wasn't that far of a journey. And so if we just move down here, we just uh, use our logic and everybody got together and, and they all took counsel and they all talked with Julius and they, and they talked to the owner of the boat and everybody was there and they, they made all of this decision and it appeared that it was a reasonable, logical decision. The problem is, is that logic is not necessarily the enemy of hurt. The Bible says there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Sometimes that you can think uh, that it makes sense to do something a certain way, but if you only use your mind, it does not protect you from hurt. The port is not the right place to winter in. We need to get to Phoenice. It only requires us to sail a little further. It's only a short distance, and there we can hunker down for the winter. But ladies and gentlemen, if it's not what the man of God, the word of God, the voice of God declared, it's not the right thing to do, no matter how much sense it makes. We live in a world where man thinks that their reasoning is that that is the supreme being. It's called humanism. We think that what we think of is what's right and what's wrong. And we want to sacrifice the word of God for our own reasoning, for our own logic. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a dangerous place to go. It will not war against hurt. It opens you up to a lot of hurt. You can think something seems right, but if you do it on your own with your own reasoning and your own logic, it is not necessarily the right thing to do you got to make sure what you believe in is in agreement with what's in the book I remember when I was just a young boy maybe about seven eight years old and and um, my uh, parents had uh, gone uh, sailing uh, there was a little place over here by the O'Galley library by the O'Galley bridge up there just on the north side it was a dock and they had a little place where you could rent catamaran sailboats and we had an evangelist and uh, his wife had come through, and, and uh, my parents had gone out with them, and they had gone sailing, and they had taken pictures. You remember the old days where you had to go get your pictures developed, and you'd have to wait for three days or whatever, and you'd, you'd get them developed. And then they showed us the pictures, and my sister and I looked at it, and they were like, oh, that looks like so much fun. How come you haven't taken your own kids? You took the preacher, but you didn't take us, you know? And so my parents said, okay, well, we'll take you guys one Saturday. We'll go out, and we'll take you guys and so they scheduled it and we went down there and we rented a catamaran boat and my dad looked it all over and we got on the boat and we got out into the Indian River and, and we had a cooler with some refreshments and drinks and sandwiches and whatnot in it and we were out there uh, on the river you know we were just sailing around and I remember uh, I had gotten cold so it must have been kind of windy and I had gotten my dad's t-shirt I was young and small at that time and my dad's t-shirt just sort of engulfed me and so I had brought my hands up on the inside of it and I had covered my knees and we were I was sort of in this like straight jacket as it were of this t-shirt and we were uh, inside uh, of this shirt and we were all just on the catamaran which has you know kind of two pontoons and a canvas area in the middle and we were sitting there and in the middle of the Indian River the mask broke in two like snapped and when it did, the whole boat capsized, and, and I just started going down uh, because of this uh, attire that I was in. And I, I can remember in my mind's eye seeing the inside uh, of the Indian River and, and seeing it going down, thinking, well, this must be it. And my mom saw me going down and reached down and, and pulled me up, saved my life. And uh, the boat was flipped upside down, but there were two pontoons uh, that were floating. And uh, so we gathered ourselves, our family, 
Denise, uh, my sister, my parents, we were all uh, okay. We were on, hanging on to these pontoons, and uh, our ice cooler had kind of just drifted away. And uh, my, my dad uh, didn't tell us this at the time, but he was inclined to swim over to the ice cooler uh, to br bring it, get it back. Because back then, you know, you don't have cell phones and all that. We had to just hang on until somebody come and rescued us. And we didn't know how long that was going to be. And it would make sense. It would be logical uh, to, you know, have drinks or, or have maybe a sandwich or whatever to sustain us out there in the hot sun and whatever, upside down the boat, hanging onto a pontoon, uh, you know, to have maybe a, a water or something that we could drink. So it seemed logical to go after that. So uh, he started to swim over and grab the cooler and come back, uh, but he just felt a check in his spirit not to swim to the cooler. And shortly after he felt that check, just seconds later, uh, he got a terrible cramp in both of his legs that rendered both of his legs unmovable. And uh, it took some time to work through that. No doubt if he had tried to swim to that cooler uh, to just bring that back, he would have uh, no doubt experienced those cramps as he was swimming there. And of course, uh, it would have been very, um, you know, questionable whether or not he could have gotten back uh, to the pontoons where his family was. And so because he overrode his logic of going after the cooler and he stayed with what he felt the Holy Ghost was telling him to do, and that is to stay with your family. Everybody here is safe. Stay with the boat, even though it's upside down. Uh, we were all eventually saved, obviously, and we all made it. How much of a lesson is that for life? Sometimes we want to swim off and we want to chase something that really is not all that important. And we forsake that that is so important, our own salvation, our own family. Ladies and gentlemen, there's nothing more important than taking care of what God has given you. You've got to protect your Holy Ghost. You've got to protect your spirit. You've got to protect that is valuable. Sometimes that will even require you to do something that's illogical. But if you see it in the Word of God, if you feel it in your spirit, hallelujah, then don't let your logic override obedience to the Word of God. Hallelujah. I'm thankful that the Word of God will direct us. Uh, I'm thankful, hallelujah, that logic and learning is not the antidote to hurt. Uh, the Bible even said in Romans, professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. It's important for you and I to realize there is no higher value than the Word of God. Now, Julius, the Roman centurion, he listened to the owner of the boat rather than Paul. And no doubt that decision uh, to, to leave their port against Paul's advice was a financial decision. The owner of the boat knew the longer they had to wait, then the longer it would take for the cargo to get to Rome, and thus the longer the delay in being paid, which leads us to the fourth thing that we know is not the enemy of hurt, and that is money. We think that money will insulate us from everything. Ladies and gentlemen, you can have a lot of money and be in a lot of hurt. Money alone will not protect you from hurt. America has been blessed, but we are not immune to hurt. In fact, a case can be made that the more affluence, the more emptiness. You can have a lot of money. You can have a bank account full of money, but your heart be empty and void of purpose and peace. So the real enemy to hurt is not in money. It's not in financial decisions. The real enemy to hurt is found in the words of Paul. When Paul warned that hurt would come, no doubt as a prisoner, his warning was probably viewed as being mixed with ulterior motives. Well, of course you don't want to sail. You don't want to get to Rome. You're a Roman prisoner. You want to delay it as long as you can. The centurion gave you a liberty to be with your friends. So of course you don't think that we should go. So they dismissed his advice, but actually it was the mercy of God to save this crew. And it could have all been a avoided if they would have obeyed what Paul said, which brings us to what is the true enemy of hurt. I want to give you three things from this story that will give you a revelation as to what will war against hurt, hurt to a nation, hurt to you individually, hurt to your family, hurt to your marriage, hurt to every aspect of your life. The very first thing that we know from the Word of God that will war, that is the enemy of hurt, is obedience. 
obedience. Our nation was founded on the principles of obeying the word of God. But if you take that obedience out of the equation, you open yourself up to a world of hurt. I went to the doctor this past week and for my annual checkup deal, they take your blood and all that and make sure everything's still going good. And uh, the doctor is uh, Dr. Dave Weldon that used to be our congressman for whatever, 20 plus years. And he still has a lot of that in his heart. So whenever we uh, go and visit, uh, we end up talking for 30, 40 minutes. He gets behind on all of his other patients because we talk about where America's at and what it needs and the help and so forth. And he's a conservative Christian. So we have a lot of common ground and he's a good man. He's spoken here at this church. But uh, we got to talking just uh, this past Thursday. And as we were talking about um, America and uh, he, he started making some observations that I agreed with him wholeheartedly. And he said, America uh, was founded by, by godly people that built uh, the, the nation on biblical principles. Built it on obedience to biblical principles. And he said, now uh, everybody looks around and they say the nation's in trouble and we're in a world of hurt. But he said, I think that it's just the derivative of the fact that we took God out of the schools 60 years ago. We've taken God out of the courtroom years ago. We've taken God out of the workplace. You take God out of the equation. You take obedience to the word of God out of the equation. Guess what you do? I don't care how much money you got. I don't care how big your navy is. None of it matters if you don't have the blessing of God upon you. It doesn't matter if you're a nation, if you're an individual, or if you're just a married couple with two children, a house, and a white picket fence. You've got to obey the word of God Julius liked Paul but he made a business decision and he did not follow the advice that was given by the man of God think about how much hurt we could avoid if we just obeyed the word of God it's interesting when you look to the word of God the word of God in my estimation in many people's estimation is the answer for life everything that we need to live a fulfilled life, that want, the, the life that God created us to live, is found in the Word of God. And if you look in the book of Judges, you see a similar trend over and over again. It's a cycle. It's a, the nation of Israel went through it. It's five different steps, and it happens even all the nations of history, and, and we see it even in America. And here's the cycle. The cycle starts with prosperity. A nation begins to rise to power. It begins to be affluent. And then from that comes decadence. Uh, they, they enjoy prosperity to the point... Uh, where it becomes a decadence and opulence and and it overrides and that leads to immorality and then immorality leads to judgment and judgment leads to repentance and then after you repent God begins to bless again so you get back to prosperity so you have prosperity and decadence and immorality and judgment and repentance and prosperity and decadence and it goes around and around and around and it has for thousands and thousands of years you would think we would learn but we're dealing with this flesh. We're dealing with human nature. And as we see in the word of God, we certainly see in our society today that we're oftentimes stubborn learners because we think somehow the model is not going to apply to us. But ladies and gentlemen, it goes through that vicious cycle, prosperity, decadence, immorality, judgment, and repentance. And obedience breaks down between decadence and immorality. Because when you have prosperity, it is easy to get a false sense of security that then affects our level of obedience. When you get a certain amount of affluence, uh, it, it, it's used to leverage relationships and bad habits develop that causes us to move away from the feeling that we need to obey a moral code or we need to obey the word of God or even the moral code of our society. And so uh, it, it's illustrated in the, in the rich young ruler that we read about in the, in the gospel of Mark. He turned away sorrowfully because he loved his possessions more than he did obedience to Jesus. Now that's interesting because he could have been the happiest man on earth. But he turned away hurt, sad, grieved, because the Bible said he had much possession. Mark chapter 10 and verse 22. And he was sad at that saying and went away grieved for he had great possessions. Now when he approached the Lord, he said, I, I've obeyed all of the commandments. He approached the Lord on the basis of his obedience. And the Lord said, that's wonderful. Now go and sell all that you have and give to the poor. Whoa, I'm not as sure of where that commandment came from. And the Bible says that he went away grieved. 
Went away grieved. Why? Because he couldn't obey that aspect of it. That's the way that cycle works. And so what happens is when you get prosperity, you get decadence and you move around and before long it's immorality because you start to do what seemeth right in your own eyes. Why should I listen to anybody? I got more money than you. Why should, I don't care. I don't have to do it. And immorality starts to come about because we get a false sense of security that like we're fine, that we're okay. We're the nation of America. We've got oceans on every side. Who's going to invade us? We've got the biggest Navy. We've got the biggest Air Force. We don't need God anymore. Careful. Careful. You're opening yourself up to a world of hurt, America. You're opening yourself up to a world of hurt, my friend. If you think, I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're the CEO of a company. I don't care if you got enough money in the bank to buy and sell everybody in this building. If you don't have an obedience to the word of God, you are putting yourself in a place of a world of hurt. Oh, my friend, you got to make up in your mind, I'm going to serve the Lord. Hallelujah. Everything that has come my way is simply the result of the blessing of God. It's not my own intellect. It's not my personality. It's not because of who I am. It's because of who he is. He is the great and the mighty God and every good gift coming down from the Father of lights. When I was, uh, when I was just a young man, uh, going to Bible school at 17 years old in St. Paul, Minnesota, and, and uh, applying different jobs. I, I got a job working for 3M, which was a great job, a great company, uh, Fortune 500 company, 3M, Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing is what it stands for. And I worked in their banking division, which was Eastern Heights State Bank, and they put me in a branch in a little city of Woodbury, Minnesota. And I hadn't worked there long, and they, they had me in charge of closing up the drive through Everybody went home. The lobby, you know, always closes earlier than the drive through And so everybody would go home, and they left me, an 18-year-old kid, uh, by myself. Uh, no security guards, no other tellers, no supervisors, uh, in charge of the drive through which now, looking back, seems like a really risky move. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, we, 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 we managed it the best we could, and I remember one day we were at work, and I worked on the teller line with, with other tellers during the day, and there was a, a teller, uh, a girl that worked to my right. Her name was Anna, A-N-N-A. And uh, we were all working one day. I can't remember. It was maybe like a Monday or a Tuesday. And they came in, and they arrested her and put her in handcuffs and marched her out of the bank. And so, you know, we're all looking around, you know, like cows looking at a new gate. Like, what in the world just happened right there? And so... Uh, they called us in and the managers came and talked to us and they said what had happened was that Anna had gotten this idea that she would take the money from her drawer and she would go to Vegas and she would gamble and she'd make a lot of money and then she would come back, put the money back in the drawer and then she would keep the, the gain for herself. Makes sense logically. <laughs> However, hello. Hello. So it didn't work out like she thought it would, and she lost money, and she got audited on Monday, and of course, she got arrested, and so forth. Now, they told us the story, and then they said, now here's what we want to tell you. And so they, they took it as a teaching moment, and we were very attentive to what they had to say at the moment. And they said, now here's something we want to tell you, and I'll never forget what they taught us that day because it's a good lesson for life. They said, just because you're handling the money, just because you're the custodian of your drawer, just because you count it and you give an account for it, does not mean that it's yours. You are just handling it. Ladies and gentlemen, what would we do if we got a revelation that what is in our hand, we're just leasing. We are just the caretaker. We are just the custodian of every gift that God has given us, but we know that it all belongs to him. If you get that revelation, you won't close your fist. You won't try to hoard. You'll say, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh. I'm just thankful I get to be a part. You'll save yourself a world of hurt if you just let it flow through. After the gang in Acts 27 set sail and got into trouble, they started listening to Paul. And to Julius' credit, he learned his lesson and got on the right path. Which leads us to the second thing that will war against hurt, and that is humility. The first thing is obedience. 
The second thing is humility. The Bible talks about humbling yourself under the mighty hand of God. Now, let me just say this since it's the 4th of July. This is another thing where America's got in trouble. We used to be a humble people. Have you noticed just driving around town, just going into restaurants, that we seem to have a loss of civility in our nation? Everybody's mad. Everybody's worn at each other. You go up to the halls of Congress, there's nobody up there humbling themselves. There's nobody up there saying, hey, we got to get back to God. We better start with repentance. We better start with prayer. It's all, look who we are. Look what we've done. Look how great. Look how blah, 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 blah. You are nothing without God. Nothing without God. Oh, I feel the boldness of the Holy Ghost. If we don't humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, if you get so blessed, you get all worked up and you think you're this, you think you're that, you don't think you need church, you don't think you need the word of God, you don't think you need the teaching of God. I'm going to tell you something right now. You are putting yourself in position. The Bible said that pride goeth before destruction. You better wake up and realize, hey, I just get to partake in heavenly places. It's a blessing that I even get to preach the word of God. It's a blessing that I even get a chance to teach the word of God. It's an incredible miracle that the Lord allows me to sit in heavenly places. Who am I, Lord, or my family, or my parents, that you would bless me? But I thank you, Lord. You gotta have a spirit of appreciation, and you gotta get up every day and say, the Lord has been good to me. Jesus. If you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that's not the posture of hurt. Or pain, it's the posture of peace. Genesis 26, 26 tells us a great story. Abimelech was a king that had often war against Abraham. Abraham had left Ur, the Chaldeans, with his family. They had moved through, and the Lord was leading them into this, this land. He gave them the promise, the covenant. I'll make your seed as the stars of the sky and the sand of the sea. And so Abimelech was, was a king that had already kind of developed himself in that area. He, he was really one that warred against uh, Abraham a lot. Abraham had died now, and Isaac, his son, was in charge of the herds and the and the families and servants, and whatnot. And so they were just basically a, a a band of nomads. And Abimelech and the gang they were much more established. Genesis twenty six twenty six gives us an interesting, a little portal to look into in this relationship. It says then Abimelech went to him, referring to Isaac, from Gerar, and Ahuzath, one of his friends, and Philcoy, the chief captain of his army. So these three guys, the axis of power, Abimelech, uh, Huzath, and uh, the core of Fachol, these three, they come together. And Isaac said unto them, wherefore come you to me, seeing ye hate me? Why are you three come to me? Because it's obvious that you hated my father, you hate me. Isaac knows he's going to be tested. Now he's the son, his dad has died, and here comes these guys. Why are they coming? They, they obviously are, are mortal enemies. They war against us. I know that you hate me. You've sent me away from you. You've said there's not room for me and my people and our cattle in this land. And it, 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 certainly Abimelech was in the power position, as it were, in the natural life. But here's what they said, verse 28. Isaac says, why did you come? You, we all know that you hate us. They said, we saw certainly that the Lord was with thee. And we said, let there be now an oath between us, even between us and thee, and let us make a covenant with thee. And thou wilt do us no hurt as we have not touched thee, and as we have done unto thee nothing but good, and have sent thee away in peace, thou art now the blessed of the Lord. In other words, they were saying, we recognize that God's favor is upon you. And because we do, recognize that we want to be in harmony with you we want to be in agreement with you we won't hurt you you don't hurt us ladies and gentlemen can i tell you that one with god is a majority it would appear that julius had the power position he was a roman centurion and paul was a prisoner it would be pretty obvious that the the roman centurion was in the power position but yet he recognized that paul had a relationship with god abimelech had to recognize that isaac had a relationship with god can i tell you something one of the biggest things about you being blessed on your job is because you're on the job
The reason that your company is blessed where you work is because you're there. Why do you think Egypt was blessed? It's because Joseph was there. One of the best things going for your place of employment is that you're there. If your boss wants to give you a raise, you ought to say thank you because the whole company is being blessed because of you. You say, oh, pastor, I'm just, I'm down the furthest end of the totem pole. I I don't have any position, but you've got a relationship with God. (laughs) And any man or woman that's got any sense will say, hey, I want to bless you and your family because it's obvious that God is on your side. I got to. Got to get to my sermon here. Sorry, I got so excited. Verse 20, Acts 27 and verse 20. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us. Watch this. All hope that we should be saved was then taken away. But after long abstinence, after a long time, Paul stood forth in the midst of it. He wouldn't talk for a long time. He waited till they got good right up in the middle of the teeth of that storm. Until they finally said, we don't have a hope. Paul said, now they're ready to listen. Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, sirs, you should have hearkened unto me. Let me put it in our modern day vernacular. I told you so. How many times did your parents say, I told you so. I told you if we weren't running around that gang, you were going to get in trouble. I told you so. Well, I just thought my mom and dad were dumb, but now I get older, I realize how smart they were. We'd save ourselves a whole bunch of pain if we'd have just obeyed. Come on, somebody. Paul said, you should have listened to me. I like Paul, hallelujah. He reminded them, what I told you before is now obvious. Now, there's nobody, there's no record here. In fact, later on, Julius even tells his own soldiers to listen to Paul. There's no record of anybody, a Roman centurion, a guard, a soldier, nobody saying, hey, just sit down, Mr. Loudmouth. We know that you were right, but who are you? You just sit down and keep quiet. They all had to humble themselves. Yes, Mr. Paul. Yes, Mr. Paul. Yeah. Humility. Humility will guard you against hurt. He says, and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. Now, this is why you're having harm. This is why you got pain. This is why you're suffering. Because I told you not to do this. And now, I exhort you to be of good cheer. Say what? <laughs> be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. You're still going to lose your ship, Mr. Ship Owner. Yes, sir. You're going to lose your boat. Because yes, you was worried about getting to Rome. Yes, sir. Instead of listening to the preacher. So even though nobody's going to die, because I got to get to Rome and all y'all are with me, I feel like I got to go back and visit that point again. Don't you understand there's a splash over effect? That's why it would behoove you to hang out with righteous people. You can hang around with all your idiot friends and all they're going to do is get you in trouble. Or you can say, I'm going to align myself with the people of God and there's a benefit to that. Even if you're not right with God, get with people that are right with God. Man, I'm glad y'all are here. Y'all keep me encouraged. (laughs) I exhort you, be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among the ship. There's still going to be consequences. To the disobedience. You're still going to lose your ship, but nobody's going to die. For there's, here's why. For there stood by me this night the angel of God. Now, there may have been a time when all the Roman soldiers and even the prisoners would have rolled their eyes and, oh, here's Mr. Super Spiritual. Got angels standing by him. Yeehaw. But because they were in a desperate situation, they were all like, yes, sir. Whose I am and whom I serve. I'm not saying this out of my own cockiness. I'm telling you this because of my relationship with God. There stood by me this night the angel of God whose I am and whom I serve saying, Fear not, Paul. Thou must be brought before Caesar and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. 
If you're not right with God, at least get on the boat with those that are right with God. We're going to all get there because the Lord said, I got to get to Caesar. And because we're all in this together, let's go. go. Ladies and gentlemen, even when you make mistakes, you ought to keep going to the house of God. You ought to stay in the ship of Zion. Even when you're not doing right, just stay on the boat. Say, I got to make it to the other side. I got to get there one way or another. I'm not giving up now. It took some humility. They had to have obedience, which they forsook, but now they're being forced to deal with some humility. Verse 30, and as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea under color as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship. They're at the front. We're going to let down these anchors over here. They were actually letting down the dinghy, the other boat. Yeah, we're putting down these anchors up here. See if we can get some stability in this wild sea. And the whole time they're going, put the boat down. We got to get out of Dodge. We got to get on another boat and get off this thing. They were doing it under disguise. Paul said to the centurion, Julius, and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. We're going to either all be saved, or if they leave, everybody else is going to be lost. Julius said, I'll take care of that. He told his soldiers, go up there and cut the ropes on those lifeboats. The soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. Every other boat. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you've got to make up in your mind, I've got no alternative plan. I got no plan B. I got no golden parachute. This is it right here. We are all going to sink or swim based on the word of God. Either this is right or we have all wasted our life. But ladies and gentlemen, you got to make up in your mind. I'm cutting off every other opportunity. I'm cutting all alternative measures. I'm saying, hey, I believe, hallelujah, what thus saith the word of God. I believe with my heart to, that if I'm going to be saved, i got to stay on the boat. They let her fall off, and while the day was coming on, Paul besought them to all take meat, saying, This day is is the fourteenth day that you have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Now watch this, verse 34. Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat, for this is your health, for there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. Now, he reiterates this. You remember before he says, be of good cheer, um, because there's not going to be any loss of life. We're all going to make it. I know it doesn't look that way right now, but we're all going to make it. He talks for a little bit more. They got this little thing where the, 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 some of the uh, crew tried to you know, make a run for it. They get all that. The soldiers cut the boats loose. And then Paul says again, there is not a hair that is going to fall from your head. Which leads us to the third thing. Obedience. Humility, and the third thing that wars against hurt is hope. you got to have hope. There's nothing that brings on despair like the thought that things are not ever going to change. I'm going to always be dealing with this junk. That's what brings hurt. That's what brings despair. And even though they were in a terrible storm... Paul kept giving them hope because hope wars against hurt. Hurt tries to hit you, depression, and everything tries to come at you. But oh, yea, though the Lord slay me, yet will I trust him. Oh, I'm tried as gold. I'm going to come forth. Hallelujah. You got to just keep believing. Tomorrow is going to be better than yesterday. Oh, hallelujah. I know I've had loss. I know we're in a storm. I know that there's hurt and pain, but we're going to make it. We're going to make it. Oh, hallelujah, absolute hurt and despair. It dissipates when there's hope. It has to run to the shadows whenever there's hope. Hallelujah. When you say, I can make it, God's for me. And if God be for me, who can be against me? Make up in your mind. Paul, he was uh, discouraged whenever he left Athens and went to Corinth. And he, he left Athens feeling discouraged. He tried to reach... Uh, those Epicureans and Stoics and the philosophers of that day on Mars Hill with his own intellect and his own learning education. It can only get you so far. 
And you, you can read it in his writings. He determined in his heart that he would not go to Corinth with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in the power and in the demonstration of the Holy Ghost. So he prayed. He must have prayed all the way to Corinth because when he got to Corinth, he went in the synagogue and he started teaching, but there was something different about him. In Acts 18 and verse 9, it says, Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee. Oh, I feel like God's telling somebody this right now. Be not afraid of the doctor's report, for I am with thee. Be not afraid of what's happening on your job, for I am with you. Be not afraid of the turmoil in your home, for I am with thee. And no man shall sit on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. Don't ever forget to, that as long as you're a worshiper, God's going to protect you because God needs worshipers of the one true living God in Palm Bay and Melbourne and South Bavard. As long as you're trying to live a righteous life, I said God is going to protect you because God needs a witness in this city. God needs a righteous people in this city. And if you live for him, if you're a worshiper of God, he's going to provide for you and protect you. I have much people in this city. Everybody on that ship in Acts 27 made it. The soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. The soldiers' counsel. They go to Julius once again. We need to kill all the prisoners. Because once everybody gets off this boat and starts heading the land, we're not going to be able to control them. We just need to kill them all now. But the centurion... Willing to save Paul. <laughs> Kept them from their purpose. And commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. And the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. Whatever you can find. The boat's busted up. The bow, water's coming in. But we can see land. It was Melita. The Bible calls it Melita. It's Malta. It's that, that island. We know right where it is in the Mediterranean. They had gotten up in an area and land was there. I know you're in a storm. I know the boat's coming apart. But do what you got to do. If you can swim, make for the land. If you're not a good swimmer, grab a piece of the boat, but hang on. Oh, my friend, you may have been going through a storm, but hang on. Grab a piece of the boat and hang on. Because Jesus is coming back. There's hope. I said there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Come on. The light of God's love is shining through the dark clouds of disappointment, the dark clouds of hurt and pain and despondency and depression. There is the light of God's love. It's right there. You can see it. You can grasp it. Just do whatever it takes to get there. Would you stand to your feet? Do whatever you have to do. Get to a place of safety. It's the same thing that happened as that crowd gathered around the upper room in Acts chapter 2. Peter preaches to them. They say, what must we do to be saved? Humility, obedience, hope. Peter gives them hope. Even though 50 days ago, the Messiah that had come to save you, you crucified him and hung him on a tree. In any definition of the word, that was a mistake. It's not over yet. You're in a storm because of the decision you made. Your life's coming apart. But there's hope. Grab a board. Grab a piece of the ship. Do what you got to do. But get to the other side. Get to safety. What must we do to be saved? They were convicted. They were pricked in their heart. Acts 2.37 says. Peter standing up with the 11. said, you got to repent of your sins. That's humility. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That's obedience. That's right. And 
ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's the hope. It's the plan of salvation. The enemy wants to hurt you. Sin wants to destroy you. But God says, I'm willing to go to war against hurt on your behalf. I'm willing to give you the plan of salvation. And guess what happened? I can see it. I've seen it many of times, uh, all in crusades. I've seen it even in Palm Bay as we had that crusade over there at Bayside High uh, Stadium just a few months ago. People kneeling down. I can see them in the streets all around the upper room. Uh, people kneeling down on the streets on their knees. Uh, all of those Jews. Uh, we made a mistake, but it's not over with yet. Uh, I'm going to grab a piece of a board. Uh, I'm going to find my way to an altar. Uh, I'm going to kneel down in this street right here, uh, and I'm going to ask God to forgive me and they all begin to repent and that day 3,000 of them were added to the church 3,000 of them found hope 3,000 of them found a piece of board 3,000 of them said it's not over with yet as long as there's life and breath in these lungs I'm going to bless the Lord oh my soul as long as I can believe I'm going to keep on believing that Jesus is the answer Jesus is the hope for a lost and dying world why don't you step out right now where you're standing? Why don't you come down to this altar? Why don't you stand down here at this altar, lift up your hands, and lift up your voice, and say, God, would you hear my cry right now? Maybe you're in a storm, maybe you're not. Just grab a piece of wood. Come on. Grab a piece of the ship. Come on, I can find my way to safety. Come down to this altar right now. Come on, the Lord will stand right next to you. You're not by yourself. You're not alone. Come on, the Lord is calling you right now. He's drawing you. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, it's not over with you. We stand before you, Lord. Forgive us of our sin, oh God. Forgive our nation, oh God. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us, Jesus. Here I am. Come on, would you talk to the Lord right now? Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. In the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Jesus! 